record. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Dream CPAR seminar today. Um, I'm Professor Hannah Stewart, and it's a great pleasure uh, today to welcome Dr. Amy Hahn, um, who is our speaker. She's a postdoctoral researcher in mechanical engineering at Stanford University. Um, and in fact, uh, Amy and I were lab mates before 2018 in the biomimetics and dextrose manipulation lab at Stanford University. Um, Dr. Hahn received her BS from, uh, uh, from Georgia Tech in mechanical engineering and then received her MS and PhD in mechanical engineering once again at Stanford University. Um, and I'm really excited to say that um, she is starting as a faculty member at Seoul National University starting this January 2022. Um, so we're wishing you all the best. I'm um, sure you're going to do wonderful things. Now, her research interests include mechanism and robot design with a special focus in haptics and gripping and medical devices um, and just really wonderful, wonderful work. So please join me in uh, giving a warm welcome to Dr. Amy Hahn. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you for the introduction and inviting me to this talk. Uh, let me share my screen and start the presentation. Okay. Um, let me just fix one thing. Sorry. Video. Okay, great. You can see my screen, right? Yes, it looks great. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me once again and attending my talk. Uh, today, I'll be talking mostly about my past PhD research, which was on electrosoft, soft electrostatic technologies for cutaneous interaction, mainly haptics and grasping. So the definition of cutaneous is of relating to or affecting the skin. And cutaneous interaction is at the cutting edge of robotic interactions with humans and environments. Now, I'll be talking about two applications for cutaneous interaction, uh, which are haptics and gripping or grasping. Uh, so there is increasing interest in soft robotics, which uses soft and flexible materials. Unlike traditional robots, which are rigid and heavy, uh, these soft robots are inherently safe for interaction with humans and environments, as you see in these videos. Although it is more challenging to apply large forces or precise motion control with soft robots, they can be compact, lightweight, or energy efficient, which are important qualities for human-robot interaction. Uh, however, these attributes depend on the actuation method, and it is challenging to meet all three at the same time. Uh, so let's take a look at the three main actuation methods that are available for soft robots. First method is pneumatic actuation. It can produce large force and strain. Uh, however, it requires pressure regulators and valves, uh, so it is challenging to make it compact and lightweight. Uh, second method is joule heating, uh, which is used for SMA wires. When SMA is heated, heated it contracts. It provides high force to weight ratio, but because it depends on heating and cooling cycles, the energy efficiency is low and the response is slow. The third, uh, third method is electrostatic actuation, for example, for electroactive polymers. When voltage is applied to electroactive polymer actuator, it expands. Unlike pneumatic actuation, it can be compact and lightweight, and compared to joule heating, it can be energy efficient uh, and can be fast because it uses very little current and uh, takes little time to charge and discharge the actuator. So therefore, uh, electrostatic actuation is the most suitable technologies for meeting these attributes, which are important for the application that I'll talk about today. So my goal was to develop soft electrostatic technologies that are compact, lightweight, and energy efficient. And during my PhD, uh, I developed three electrosoft technologies uh, for haptics and gripping applications uh, because they are because soft technology 
is useful for these applications. Haptics require safe interaction with human skin and gripping requires safe interaction with objects. And being compact, lightweight, and energy efficient makes them wearable, portable, or even handheld. Before I go into each application, I like to briefly explain what haptics mean. Haptic feedback is sense of touch, and it is crucial in doing tasks as you see in these videos. Compared to a normal hand, a hand with no touch feedback is having a lot more difficult time lighting a match, which is a very simple task. So imagine you're doing a medical procedure, uh, which requires more precise control. If you're doing medical procedure without this haptic feedback, it will be much more difficult. Uh, first, I developed two haptic devices during my PhD. One provides force feedback and the other provides texture or shape feedback. So for the first one, I did designed compact electroactive polymer actuators that can be used near an MRI scanner and built a handheld haptic device that stretches the fingertip skin to communicate needle tip forces during MRI guided teleoperated medical procedures. Second, I designed miniature uh, dielectric fluid transducers. Uh, because they're compact, they can be arranged in densely into an array and display various patterns and tactile information to users. Third, I developed hybrid electrostatic electrostatic hybrid pads, uh, which can adhere to micro rough surfaces. These are used for uh, picking up bulky and deformable objects with robotic arms or in collaboration with a human arm. Uh, so now I'll go into each uh, technology in detail. So for the first technology, uh, I specifically focus on designing the haptic device in an extreme environment, which is near an MRI machine. It is very challenging to design an MR compatible robotic system because metals or flowing electrical currents are not allowed in the high magnetic field, which rules out many technologies. Uh, MR guided interventions have been emerging because they provide clear image, images of tissues and therefore can reduce false negative rate and give you more accurate cancer location. However, since the size of the bore is small, there's not much space, uh, not much space for the physicians to do work. Uh, so when physicians do biopsies, the patient is pulled in and out of the MRI bore as the needle is inserted into the patient little by little until the target tissue is reached. So a simple biopsy task can take up to an hour. So our idea was to use a teleoperated system meaning the patient stays inside the MR bore with minimal tools nearby, and the physician manipulates the needle outside the MR bore. This way you can save time and cost. However, most teleoperated systems do not have haptic feedback, which means that you won't be feeling any forces at the needle, which is crucial for some procedures. So we want to design a haptic device to provide sensations as if your hands were inside the MR bore manipulating the actual needle. Other researchers have developed teleoperative systems for MR guided needle interventions. Uh, these consist of both mechanical control systems where forces are transmitted through mechanical linkages and electronic control systems where electromechanical actuators are used instead. Uh, these usually provide force feedback on the same channel as the control input, meaning the same part of the device is used to control the manipulation and to give haptic feedback. Unlike most teleoperative systems, uh, I'm, I was interested in adding a separate channel for haptic feedback so that it is decoupled from the control system and haptic feedback is clearly distinguishable from any other forces coming from the device. And I like to provide a feedback uh, by stretching a fingertip skin because it is perceived intuitively and quickly by users. And for this later, lateral skin stretch feedback, it is desired to be around 0.05 to one millimeter of displacement and 0.1 to two newtons of force to be perceptible. So we'll target these goals. 
Uh, finally, I'm interested in uh, electronic control system because you can selectively choose which force to display, unlike mechanically linked systems. Uh, specifically, we'll be focusing on detecting membrane puncture using our haptic device because it, this is useful information to have in a variety of procedures. So for example, during TIFF procedure where you connect two vessels, you know you're successful when you have two membrane punctures corresponding to exiting first one and entering the second one. And in a prostate biopsy, the prostate is small and it's near the bladder. Uh, and you want to make sure the needle is inside the prostate and not puncture the bladder. So therefore, uh, we'll fo focus on displaying membrane puncturing force with our haptic device. Uh, I present a handheld haptic device that stretches the fingertip skin to display membrane puncturing force. I designed electroactive polymer actuator because it is MR compatible, it is compact and lightweight, it can produce enough force and displacement for skin stretch haptic feedback, and it's fast enough uh, to display dynamic events. Electroactive polymer is a dielectric uh, elastomer covered with electrodes on top and bottom. When voltage is applied, electrostatic, uh, the electrodes compress, uh, attract each other and compresses the membrane in between. And therefore, it expands in lateral direction, which corresponds to this direction in this video. Uh, although EAPs are compact and MR compatible, a single EAP does not provide enough force for stretching skin. So I designed the actuator such that they're easily stackable. And I was able to uh, scale up the force by stacking multiple EEPs. So the force was increasing without compromising for displacement. Therefore, uh, by stacking multiple EEPs, I was able to meet the skin stretch feedback requirements that I mentioned in the previous slides. Because the device will be handheld, we also measure the force against uh, spring so that we can simulate how it will behave on skin. The spring had a stiffness similar to fingertip skin. Um, a six stack EEP produced about 0.8 newtons of force and 1.3 millimeters of displacement against the spring, which again satisfies the design requirements. Uh, based on the six stack EEP actuator, we designed a haptic device that are compact and lightweight. When voltage is applied, the detector moves in one direction, stretching the fingertip skin. So now that we built the device, we have to check whether it is MR compatible, whether it is safe to use near an MRI machine. To verify that, uh, we have to check three things. First, the device should be safe to use in the high, mag high, mag high magnetic field and radio frequency waves from an MRI scanner. And second, the performance of the device should not significantly be affected by the MR field. And third, uh, vice versa, the device should not be, uh, the, the device should not affect the quality of MR images. So for the first one, it was safe to use in three Tesla MRI room because we didn't use any ferromagnetic materials and also the current was very small. And second, the performance of the device was similar inside the MR bore and outside the MR bore. So this is inside and outside. And third, there was no significant noise and no image distortions when haptic device was actuated and inside the MR bore. So therefore, we verify that the device is MR compatible. Next, uh, to ver verify the functionality of haptic device during teleoperation, I designed a teleoperated system to do a membrane puncture user study. The haptic device is on the, on the leader side and is placed on the passive linear rail. And as the user moves the haptic device on the rail, the linear stage on the follower side moves accordingly and inserts the needle that is mounted on the linear stage. The needle has sensors embedded. So as the needle is inserted into the tissue phantom, the forces are measured and are sent back to the haptic device. Then the haptic device stretches the fingertip skin of the user to deliver force information. 
So you think that uh, also the fan, we also made a phantom, uh, which was filled with gelatin and has a silicon membrane that had a similar puncturing force as the outer membrane of pig liver. This is the sample force profile of a membrane puncture measured by the sensor as needle and, deli and delivered to the haptic device. This, de this video shows the synchronous motion of the needle puncturing a membrane and the haptic device. Uh, so as the needle stretches the membrane, stretching and then punctures the membrane, the detector moves accordingly and delivers the puncturing force to the users. We first train the users to get uh, get used to the membrane puncturing force at the uh, forces at the haptic device while the needle was programmed to move at a constant speed. Then the users were able to insert the needle by pushing the EAP device on a linear rail. 98% uh, of the times the user successfully detected the membrane puncture. Uh, the membrane puncturing force was similar to what we targeted, and the force displayed to users were amplified by 2.5 times. Um, and tip, the tip to membrane distance after puncture was 0.34 millimeters, which means that it is suitable for tips procedures or other precise procedures. Uh, to summarize, we developed a skin stretch haptic device that communicates needle to forces during image-guided interventions. The challenge was to make, a, make it MR compatible, uh, using MR compatible technology while having moderate strain and force. Uh, and we solved that by developing a stackable electroactive polymer actuators. And this multi-layer EEP device was suitable for displaying membrane puncture and other needle to forces. Uh, the second technology I developed is for another type of haptic device, haptic feedback, which is shape and texture feedback. For this second application, I designed the device for active haptic touch. Active haptic touch means that the users actively explore the surface to receive information they need. It delivers geometric information better than passive touch, which was the first, first haptic device. So for example, when you want to feel this surface texture, you don't receive much information if you just put your fingers on top. But when you move your fingers, slide your fingers side to side, that's when you feel the small bumps of the surface. Uh, to provide texture and shape information, we need to design haptic surface display by densely packing small actuators. Numerous haptic surface displays have been developed based on a, a variety of actuation schemes. However, it is challenging to make compact actuator that can produce large strain and has, has low power consumption. So the design goals for our haptic surface display is to overcome the challenges uh, that I just mentioned, which is to provide enough power in a compact space so that they can produce sufficient displacement and forces for stimulus. And two, to provide high enough bandwidth so that the device can produce dynamic tactile events. And third, uh, to, be light, and to be lightweight and flexible and have low power consumption. One approach to overcome the challenges is to use dielectric fluid transducers as an alternative to dielectric electroactive polymers. So EEPs have dielectric elastomer layer in between the electrodes. So, so the electrostatic force needs to work against the elast elastic material. Diele dielectric fluid transducers, DFTs, on the other hand, have dielectric fluid between the electrodes. Therefore, there is more freedom to tailor the output force as a function of displacement. Meaning um, DFTs can produce more displacement with the same electrostatic force than electroactive polymers. I present dielectric fluid transducers that are compact and has a large strain. Compared to other solutions, it works with low electric field and has very low power consumption. And it is also fast, uh, therefore suitable for a dynamic haptic display. These actuators can be packed closely and controlled individually to create dynamic texture displays. 
uh, this space are again this designed for fingertips to move back and forth to feel the texture. The actuator consists of a thin oil, oil filled pouch covered with electrodes on each side, and its opening is covered with a silicon membrane. The application of voltage causes the pouches, pouch to squeeze the oil and form a bump by stretching the silicon membrane. The size of the actuator uh, is about four by eight millimeters and its thickness is less than 300 micrometers. And this was 20 times smaller in area than other DFTs previous, previ previously developed at that time. Also, all parts are made of soft and compliant materials. Uh, the height of the bump increases with voltage uh, because as you increase the voltage, there's larger electrostatic force pushing the oil. And the maximum height was 1.5 millimeter at three kilovolts. This is high relative to the actuator size. We also measured the force at the blocked condition when the bump was forced to be flat, as if the fingertip is pushing it down. Uh, the force also increases with voltage and has 13 millinewtons at 3.5 kilovolts. Uh, later in the user studies, we confirmed that the force, this force was sufficient for a bump detection, even though it sounds very small. We also looked at the dynamic response of the actuator because the haptic surface display should be fast enough to display dynamic tactile events. The set figure shows the dynamic response to a step input. Uh, it took about 50 milliseconds to reach the 90% rise. And this is fast enough to prevent a noticeable delay in many haptics applications. Uh, this right figure shows the dynamic response to a sinusoidal input. It shows a pronounced reduction in bump height above 5 hertz. Uh, however, the bump height remains above 200 microns up to 200 hertz, which is more than sufficient for detecting vibrations. So in sum, uh, the actuator has fast dynamic response to display tactile events. To explore effect of changing dimensions on bump size and force, we created a numerical simulation in console. We vary the width, width of the height, the thickness of the pouch, uh, and, the, uh, and diameter of the opening. Uh, so when we changed the width of the pouch, there was no difference in, in force, and, force and bump height. But when you decrease the thickness of the pouch, uh, you, you get larger, larger bump size and higher pressure. And, um, and when you increase the diameter of the opening, also the size and the force of the force, force both increased. So to, to summarize, the interesting point is that the changing the size of the pouch, uh, so thereby changing the electrode area, does not have a significant effect, uh, which means that the pouch can be even smaller in area and have a similar performance. Um, because the actuators are compact, they can be arranged densely to provide various patterns. Uh, with the array prototypes, we conducted tests with human subjects to examine the functionality of the actuators. We first trained the subjects to apply a gentle contact, contact force to feel the bumps by sliding a fingertip over the bump surface. We then tested the minimum detectable threshold and the average minimum detectable bump height was 124 micron, micrometers. The value varied among the users and the part of the variation may be due to using different prototypes with some manufacturing variabilities for different users. We also observed a significant effect of training. Uh, users were able to feel a smaller bump towards the last test. The second part of the test explored the ability to display patterns using a one by three array. A thin, uh, thin layer of polyimide was placed around the bump to, uh, to provide a guide for subjects to locate each row without visual confirmation. And as you see in this video, uh, this, is how the how, uh, this is how the user study was conducted. 
Five patterns uh, with various bump heights were provided to the users in random order. The users successfully differentiated the patterns with a rate of 98.8%. Uh, it is also found that the palpation area, pressure, and speed affected their ability to detect the bump. Therefore, more training will help users find their more, most suitable conditions for active surface exploration. So in summary, from the tests with human subjects, we confirm that the bumps from our DFTs were easily detectable by users. Uh, to summarize, uh, the goal of the second uh, application was to develop a miniature actuator that is suitable for dynamic haptic surface displays. The challenges were uh, providing enough strain and sufficient force in a compact space while having high enough bandwidth so that we can display various tactile events. Uh, we we over, overcame that challenge by developing a miniature dielectric fluid transistors. An array of, uh, an array of these small dielectric fluid transistor actuators is suitable, was suitable for displaying patterns to humans. Uh, now I'll talk about my third work, uh, which was on gripping. Uh, soft technology is useful in gripping for safe interaction with objects and environments. Uh, there are numerous robotic hands ranging from a simple two finger gripper to a dexterous hand. And they're great for picking up small objects that are smaller than th the size of their hands. But when mobile robots pick up large objects, they often pick up like this. They don't utilize their fingers, but they depend on the squeezing force between their palms. They squeeze even more when they pick up heavy or slippery objects, which also means that it is challenging to pick up deformable or fragile objects. So the goal is to design a gripping pad that has high adhesion to reduce squeezing force and therefore pick up deformable objects, a wide range of shapes, materials, and roughnesses. There are several solutions for enhancing adhesion. First is to use suction. Suction, suction however, is ineffective on porous or rough surfaces. Uh, and uh, the second method is to use electrostatic adhesion. It is more tolerant of surface roughness than suction, uh, but the shear adhesion is relatively low, meaning that they cannot pick up heavy objects. Third is to use gecko-inspired dry adhesives. They have high shear adhesion on smooth surfaces, but they perform poorly on rough surfaces. Uh, so we had an idea of combining these two technologies to achieve high adhesion, even on rough surfaces. I'll be talking about this hybrid technology. Let me first introduce how Gecko Inspire adhesives work. There are micro wedges uh, that are about 100 micrometers tall, which are inspired from the hairs of a uh, gecko's foot. Uh, when the adhesives are placed on a surface, only the tips are in contact with the surface, uh, so it's not sticky. But when they're pulled in shear, the contact area increases and therefore adhesion increases due to van der Waals forces. So as you see in this video, you can lift it without, there is no peeling force, but when you shear, uh, the wedges are turned on and therefore can have high adhesion. One thing to note is that this, because they rely on van der Waals forces, the amount of contact area determines how much adhesion they get. Uh, and on micro rough surfaces, gecko adhesives do not stick well because the contact area decreases. So in order to conform better to micro rough surfaces, we need a normal force that can push the wedges onto the surface and can increase the contact area. And we can do that by adding electrostatic adhesion. Uh, this electro, uh, so you can do that so there's electroadhesive pad behind the gecko wedges. Uh, 
and this electric pad induces the opposite charges on the surface of the object and therefore is attracted pushing the adhesive onto the surface. So this pushing force increases the adhesion in two ways. First is, uh, as you see in the left video, the hybrid pad wrapping around the, uh, the hybrid pad is wrapping around the object when the voltage is turned on. So therefore it can increase the amount of contact area when the electrostatic is turned on. And second, on the right video, uh, the right video shows that with just the gecko adhesive, uh, this pad cannot pick up the microwave fabric. Uh, so initially it cannot pick up the fabric, but when you turn on the voltage, you can really see it clinging to the microwave surface and therefore it can pick up. So these are the two main advantages of adding electrostatic addition to gecko adhesives. Other groups have developed hybrid pads as well. Uh, they have used a double layer design where they put electrodes on a different positive and negative electrodes on different layers. Uh, this, this was to reduce the gap between electrodes uh, without arcing issues. However, the effect of adding electrostatic addition was relatively low. They also have uh, doped the gecko adhesive with uh, material high dielectric material so that they can amplify the electrostatic adhesion. But high, however, due to the surface roughness of the doped material, the adhesion was also relatively low. So we want to maximize this electrostatic force while maintaining the surface finish. So we have to be smart about how we combine two technologies together without compromising uh, each technology. So from this typical PDMS gecko adhesives, uh, I present a hybrid pad that has bimaterial gecko adhesives and an electro adhesive pad, um, uh, electro adhesive pad. And this hybrid pad has up to three times greater shear adhesion than gecko adhesives alone. So there are three main features of the hybrid pad that improve the adhesion. First, uh, for the electro adhesive pad, the electrode pattern was optimized uh, from simulation for the highest electrostatic force. And the electro, hybrid, electro adhesive pad looks like this. And second, the majority of the get good material was doped with high, uh, high dielectric material, as you see in this brown area. This high dielectric material further increased the electrostatic force. And third, the PDMS layer uh, improved the surface finish of the doped material, which is crucial for adhesion. So this one with PDMS layer has smooth, smoother surface finish uh, than the one without the PDMS layer, which was the completely doped material. And as you can see, uh, this is without electrostatic adhesion. It was just pure shear adhesion on different surfaces. Uh, you can see that with PDMS layer, because it has smooth surface finish and sharp tips, it can have, uh, it can maintain its good adhesion on surfaces compared to when there is no PDMS layer. And thanks to these, these three features, uh, we were able to achieve up to three times greater adhesion at five kilovolts. So this, this was a test, uh, uh, this was a shear adhesion test on different rough and surfaces. And this microscopic images show the surfaces that I tested on. Um, in general, as we increase the voltage, uh, the shear adhesion increases because the normal pressing force increases, uh, which also increases the contact area. But it didn't uh, work in improve the adhesion on smooth surface because even without voltage, the gecko adhesive already had good contact with uh, a smooth surface. Uh, so from this test, we've confirmed that the electrostatic addition makes the gecko adhesive conform to microwave surfaces, and it's more effective on microwave surfaces than smoother surfaces. Uh, I can briefly go over how I made these hybrid pads. So first we machine a wax mold using a CNC machine and a blade. 
and we spray a thin PDMS layer uh, by thinning PDMS with hexane. And once we have this PDMS layer, uh, we spray uh, calcium copper titanate doped silicone rubber, again diluted in hexane. Uh, and then before it fully cures, we roll on an electro adhesive pad and cure uh, overnight. And for the electro adhesive pad, we use a UV laser to ablate the metal, metal of this aluminum coated BOPP film. Um, I use different UV laser settings for the for the uh, for the gap area and elsewhere so that I can improve, we can cut it more faster. Uh, this allowed the film to have clean edges and no residue of metal at the gaps, which is very important to avoid arcing. Uh, so with 600 micrometers of electro width and 125 micrometer of gap, we were able to achieve up to uh, no arcing up to seven kilovolts, meaning that you can apply up to seven kilovolts. This video shows, oh, this video shows, yes, this video shows the patterned film conforming to the purple paper being listed at 0.5 kilovolts. You can really see uh, how the electrostatic force can help wedges conform to the microsurfaces. So finally, uh, we designed a gripping pump that can be used for collaborated lifting. With these pumps, uh, a human and a robot collaborated to lift a grocery bag. Uh, this is challenging uh, because it is easily deformable and the gecko adhesives do not stick well on this surface. This is the close-up of the hybrid pad adhering to the paper bag. Uh, even though the initial contact condition is not good, the hybrid pad clings onto the surface and maintains a good contact area. And with the hybrid pad, we were able to reduce the squeezing force by half compared to when no voltage was applied. So just the gecko pad. Uh, next, two robotic arms lifted objects in collaboration. We were able to pick up a deformable bag of snack bars with less than 0.1 newtons of force. This corresponds to an effective coefficient of friction of more than 100. The robots were able to pick up objects with various weights, shapes, and textures, including deformable objects with small squeezing force. Uh, so with the hybrid pad, less than five newtons was applied to pick up all of these objects. To summarize, uh, the goal was to develop high adhesion gripping pads to reduce squeezing force. The challenges were conforming to surfaces and shapes. Um, and the main challenge was to incorporate doped material without affecting the surface finish of the microstructured adhesives, because that really affects the adhesion of the gecko wedges. Uh, by, by developing two-stage fabric, two fabrication uh, by material wedge, wedge design, we were able to uh, achieve up to three times greater shear adhesion with electrostatic adhesion and therefore was able to uh, grasp a variety of micro rough surfaces, shapes, and deformable objects. And we were able to reduce the squeezing force by more than half. Uh, I also wanted to briefly show, uh, show you what's, what we've been working on after this work. Uh, so uh, we've been designing end defectors for bimanual mobile robots. Uh, bimanual mobile robots have limited degrees of freedom and their end effectors, and they're unable to finally adjust the angles of the end effector, which makes uh, makes it harder to use hybrid pad because you have to is you have to maintain good contact area between the pad and the object. So we built an end effector that has additional me mechanisms, uh, additional rotational freedoms that can help the hybrid pad conform to surfaces with light squeezing force. Uh, where 
uh, about to submit the paper, so I cannot share too much of information, but I wanted to give you a preview of a test that we did on different surfaces. Um, so this, this light gray color is this robot is called digit, digit and defector cover, covered with nail print so that we can increase the friction and therefore uh, can lift it better. And these two, uh, darker gray and the orange plots are the values, the gripping force with the hybrid path. And as you can see, um, with the electrostatic addition, we were able to uh, decrease the gripping force by more than 10 times compared to the just original end defector and up to 60% compared to uh, no voltage. And therefore we're able to pick up this uh, delicate deformable uh, bouquet of flowers with very light squeezing force. So this was kind of an overview of my PhD work. Um, um, and my PhD work was on soft technologies, which are useful for interaction with humans and environments. And before I end my talk, I'd like to briefly introduce what I'm working on right now as a postdoc. And a good segue question is, where else can soft technology be useful other than uh, these two applications? I'm currently designing an implantable device for a baby's heart. Uh, soft technology is useful here because the device has to safely interact with tissue inside the body. Uh, so babies with hypoplastic left heart syndrome are born with smaller left side of the heart. Although this disease is not common, it is responsible for 25% of early cardiac death in newborns. And the left side of the heart is usually, uh, it, not usually, is responsible for pumping blood to the rest of your body. So it's, it's an important function of the heart. Um, however, current palli pal palliative solutions do not cure HLHS, meaning that they don't uh, recover the uh, smaller left, left ventricle, but they go through three-stage surgery where they reroute the blood so that only the right side of the right side of the heart is doing the work, and they're kind of abandoning the left side. Uh, it has been found that applying strain, mechanical strain in fiber direction, can cause fiber to lengthen um, in myocardium, uh, and by lengthening the fibers in in heart cells, uh, cardiac muscle cells, we can increase the volume. So based on the study, uh, instead of uh, abandoning the not working, non-functioning left ventricle, uh, our goal is to design a device that can apply mechanical stretch to induce favorable growth and therefore restore biventricular or even 1.5 ventricular cardiac system. Uh, by following both experimental and computational approach, uh, we're, uh, we're designing this device and we're targeting single oh i think the site hasn't been updated but um we're targeting single ventricle patients uh, not just hypoplastic left heart syndrome any babies that are born with smaller left ventricle or right ventricle um, who has less severe cases and the device will be implanted during uh when the babies are about six months old uh, for about four months of period. We're, still, we're not sure whether four months will be enough to induce growth. Uh, we're doing uh, some annual studies to uh, find the right timing of the device implantation and explantation. So this device has two features. Uh, the device apply, first the device has to apply strain on epicardium, the outside layer of the uh, heart to induce growth. The strain is applied only on the outside uh, to avoid interference with the heart internal structures and blood flow. So we don't want to put a device on the inside of the heart, but rather put it around the heart. And because we're trying to induce tissue growth and L the left ventricle will be growing, the device has to grow as well so that we can maintain the appropriate amount of strain all the time. Therefore, it can, it can continue to induce tissue growth. Um, I'm, 
I cannot share too much of this yet, but um, I'm solving this design challenge through using computational modeling and using soft technology. Uh, to, to summarize all my work, uh, I have been developing technologies for haptics, gripping, and tissue remodeling. And these are the fundamental research approaches I've taken and learned throughout my work. Um, I've taken knee-driven design objectives from medicine and industry. I designed based on human haptic perception. I also designed based on strengths and limitations of actuators and used multi-physics modeling to optimize the design and developed novel manufacturing processes. And based on these research approaches, I like to tackle challenging problems in the medical field, which has been a growing field in robotics. As Hannah mentioned, um, I'm, I'm excited to join as an assistant professor in Seoul National University this coming March. Uh, and my lab will focus in the medical field using soft technology, including electrosoft technologies. My mission is to improve safety and accuracy in medical robotics. Um, these are some of the examples that I wanna focus on during my uh, initial stage of my faculty. Uh, yeah. So I'm particularly interested in surgical robots and implantable devices because they complement each other and treat patients in critical conditions. And these are some of the research questions that I am interested in solving moving on. For example, I like to continue working on haptics because if you have haptic feedback during uh, robotic procedures, the, the surgeries or procedures can be done more accurately. And also I'm interested in making surgical instruments, sensors, in, sensors embedded or a gripping tool so that you can handle tissues without damaging them. And also, um, kind Similar to what I'm working on as a postdoc, I'm very interested in um, developing implantable devices uh, because most of the implantable devices are to assist a function of an organ, but I'm more interested in making devices that can cure the disease. For, as an example, I showed that I'm working on a device that can induce tissue growth in hopes to recover, restore the function of an organ. So these are some of the things that I'll be interested in. Um, and thank you for listening to my talk and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Amy. And I hope everybody joins me in a virtual round of applause with emojis and so forth. Thank you so much. Thank you.